One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? But they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, 
I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges, and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, 
Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges, and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple." Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish." Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soul or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The 13th chapter of Luke has asked the question if few would be saved. Jesus gave the answer, teaching the need to give every effort to strive through the narrow door. Now there will be many who seek, but will not enter into the kingdom. Jesus is not looking for a casual relationship, but for those who will give everything to follow him. Jesus' teaching sets the tone for the 14th chapter of Luke. Luke is going to show us who are the ones who are thrust out, who are the many who will not be saved, who are not in the kingdom. Now, the first 24 verses of Luke 14 contain one story. The setting is another Sabbath day when the ruler of the Pharisees invited Jesus to dine with him at his house. Through our study of Luke, we have seen that the Pharisees are not genuinely questioning and learning about Jesus, but are trying to discredit Jesus. Our author Luke wants us to know that this mentality has not changed. Jesus has been invited to the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees with the same purpose in mind. Notice that the Pharisees are watching him carefully, Verse 2 reveals that there was a man at this dinner who had dropsy. Dropsy is a condition where there is a buildup of excess fluids in the cavities or tissues of the body. Luke is making a point. This man is not at this dinner by coincidence. Do you see the setup? It is the Sabbath day, and Jesus is invited to the dinner in the house of the ruler of the Pharisees. And by great surprise, there is a person who has dropsy at this dinner. And they are watching Jesus carefully. Jesus knows the heart of the people. Jesus recognizes the setup. Please notice the text says that Jesus responded or answered. The Pharisees have not asked anything yet. But Jesus is answering their hearts as he asks the question, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Notice that the Pharisees remain silent. They're not interested in learning from Jesus or considering their religious convictions. 
They just want to see what Jesus will do so they can discredit him and dispatch of him. Jesus takes the man with dropsy, heals him, and sends him away. This shows this man was not here for the dinner, but was merely a pawn in the Pharisee's plan. So Jesus heals him and sends him away. Notice Jesus' teaching. Verse 5, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? These Pharisees want to use healing as a violation of the law of Moses concerning the Sabbath, which said not to work. Jesus shows the ridiculous nature of their thinking by asking if they would rescue an ox or rescue their son who had fallen to a well. Can you imagine telling your son that you would have to stay in that well until Sunday and then I can come back to pull you out? No. Now, as we previously noted, the Sabbath was a day to remember God's grace and deliverance from Egyptian slavery when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt at the time of Moses. We see that recorded in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15. The Sabbath was a day to remember how they had been rescued by God from the hand of the Egyptians. Who does not rescue their animal on the Sabbath? How much more should God not rescue this person who is suffering from this medical condition? Now, it is easy to stop the story here because our Bible puts headers between verses 6 and 7, and that makes us want to stop. But notice that verse 7 says that Jesus told a parable to those who had been invited to this dinner. Jesus has much more to say. He does not heal this person and leave. Now Jesus will teach who's not in the kingdom of God. Verse 7 is very important. Jesus tells a parable. Jesus is not offering a lesson on dinner etiquette. Jesus is not concerned about how people sit at a table, but he is concerned about the hearts of these people because it causes them to miss out on participating in the kingdom of God. The key teaching of this parable is that it is better to let others exalt you than to be humiliated. Don't assume for yourself a position. Take the lowest place and let others give you honor. Now, while this is a practical information here, please recognize that Jesus is teaching to their hearts about their relationship to God. The proud will not be in the kingdom of God. Don't assume your position before God. Humility is required to enter the kingdom. Better for God to exalt you as you live a humble life than to assume honor and for God to humiliate you. God honors humility with exaltation. Humility is a character trait that is often misunderstood. Humility is not merely how you think about yourself. Humility is observed by our actions. How we treat others reveals humility or pride. Notice that Jesus speaks to the host of this dinner in verse 12. Don't invite people who can repay you for your kindness. Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. People who are humble do not do things to be repaid. Those in the kingdom of God are not concerned about what others can do for them. Humility is seen in doing good without expecting repayment. Do you see what Jesus was saying? Why was Jesus telling the Pharisees to invite the poor, crippled, and blind? Was he just trying to exchange one external, heartless act for another external, heartless act? No. But the humble heart cares for those who can do nothing for you in return. The scriptures teach us a critical thought that we should maintain humility and block any sort of pride. To know God is to understand his infinite greatness and goodness and our sinfulness and smallness. We are not in the kingdom receiving salvation if we do not understand this truth. Take the lowest seat in the kingdom of God. Stop thinking about yourself. Stop thinking about what others should be doing for you. Don't act like you are important or that people should give you any attention. Take the lowest seat at the table and let God exalt you. When you think you are someone, God says he will humble you. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. One writer said, it is hard to fall when you are on your knees. Amen. We need to get on our knees because God is infinitely great and good and we are so small and so sinful. Now this leads to some, shall we say, tension in the room. Have you ever been in an uncomfortable situation and you feel like something needs to be said to smooth things over? One who is at the table after hearing Jesus' teaching declares, 
Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Basically, it's going to be great for us. It seems he did not get the message of what Jesus was saying. They are the ones missing out on the kingdom of God. They are, they are the ones missing out on salvation. So Jesus tells a sharper parable to get his message across. The invitation to a great banquet has gone out. The image of a great feast or banquet was common. It was a very common symbol for the Messianic kingdom. However, when the time of the banquet has arrived, they all begin to make excuses for a variety of reasons. Everyone has things they think are more important to do. One has purchased a field. One has purchased an oxen. One has just got married. Something else is more important than the feast in the kingdom. Each person is making a judgment that other things are more valuable than Jesus and his ministry. This is sad. What could possibly be more important than sitting at the table and feasting in the kingdom? You would rather go look at a field than feast? You'd rather go look at oxen than feast? You're married and you can't come? Don't you think she would like to come to the feast also? What business could possibly be more important than making sure you have eternal life? What property could be more valuable to have than a title to heaven? What relationship could be more important than the one you have with God who made you and sent his son to die for your sins? What could be more important in your life? Who turns down a feast for these things? When we treasure other things more than we treasure Jesus, we are left out of this kingdom. We are part of the many who are seeking but will not enter because we do not give every effort to Jesus. And so the invitation goes out to the streets of the city. Those invited are the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Please notice who Jesus said is to be invited to their feast in verse 21. Yep, the poor, crippled, lame, and blind. Jesus is rescuing the outcasts. The message of the kingdom first went to the Jewish nation, but they rejected it. Therefore, they will not participate in the glorious kingdom of the Lord. Jesus is going to the rest of the world instead and inviting them to the kingdom. Verse 23, the master's goal is to fill his house. The master will take whoever will accept him and his terms. Who will treasure Jesus above all else? Who will not make excuses for the affairs of this world that they put in the way of being in the kingdom of God? We like to make all kinds of excuses for why we cannot strive and give every effort to be with him. We think that our excuses matter to God. We think we have good reasons. But in the face of what is being offered, our excuses are foolish. It's sad to me to hear all the excuses we make for why we cannot worship Jesus, serve Jesus, love Jesus, or give ourselves fully to Jesus. It truly breaks my heart to hear people think their excuse is acceptable because we are failing to see that we are treasuring the activity more than Jesus. Why isn't Bible study the most important thing in the world to us? Why isn't worship the most important thing in the world to us? We think we are seeking, but we are dying without Christ. Not only us, but the world is also dying outside of Christ. We are living in the days of verse 23. The message is going out, and God wants you to come to the kingdom. We must urge people to come. We must convince people to enter the kingdom, compel them to see the great feast that has been prepared. Hear the warning. Do not make excuses for not coming to the feast. The kingdom is filled with people who will humble themselves before God. Jesus has come to rescue us from our sins. In verse 25, the scene begins with great crowds following Jesus. Jesus turns and addresses the crowds that is accompanying him. Jesus tells them that they must hate their families and their own lives to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus is teaching that a disciple must forsake all relationships and desires. Hate does not mean we are to have an emotional hate toward our family, but that we will love them less than Jesus. Following Jesus is the disciple's first love. Following Jesus is to have priority over any family member in one's own life. Other concerns take second place to following Jesus. Discipleship is a call to allegiance. 
Jesus is to have first place over all, including family. At that time, a Jewish person who made a choice for Jesus would alienate his family. A decision for Christ marked a person and automatically came with the cost. The point is that only when one forsakes all others is one following Jesus. Otherwise, something else will have a greater pull on one's allegiance than Jesus does. Jesus must mean more to us than our families, no matter how much that we love them. There are times when our love for our families tries to get in the way of our love for Jesus. It does this when we let our parents discourage us from making a complete commitment to Christ. It does when a marriage turns inward instead of outward to serve others out of the strength of a godly partnership. Or when we have such an attachment to our children and their activities that we leave little time left to show mercy or to share the gospel. Jesus is telling us to not let the claims that our families make on us interfere with the claims that he makes on us. Many temptations come with focusing on our family, and our love for Jesus must take precedent over everything. Unless Jesus is our highest affection, we cannot be his disciples. We must love Jesus more. Self-denial is also part of the cost. We must love Jesus more than our own being. The process of discipleship is stressed here not the decision to enter into it. Verbs, if you notice, are in the present tense in verse 27. To follow Jesus means we will follow in suffering, because the world rejects the disciple of Jesus. Bearing the cross means we are willing to bear the pain of persecution as a result of following Jesus. Discipleship is not an invitation to ease and comfort, but demands sacrifice and suffering. Discipleship involves more than showing up. Jesus is calling for a passionate pursuit of him. Only a passionate pursuit will have the dedication and resolve to give up anything to be with Jesus. Jesus does not remove the cost of following him, but explains the cost. Unlike churches today that try to eliminate all the costs so that it is so easy to follow. But this is not being a disciple of Jesus, but a disciple of self. Christianity today is being promoted as glorified, holy coffee houses where you can get your coffee, listen to some music, and be entertained. We must offer nothing more than Jesus. What more is there, in fact, to offer? Bringing people in with anything else is not making disciples of Jesus, but disciples of self. Jesus gives two illustrations concerning the need to assess the cost of following him. The first illustration is of a building a tower. A tower here likely does not refer to a fortress tower, but one more like a farming building. A parallel would be building an addition to one's house. Not counting the cost means the project will not be completed. The building will stand unfinished as a monument to one's foolishness. Jesus declares that one must assess whether or not he is ready to take on the personal commitment and sacrifice required to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is not an invitation to an ice cream social. Jesus has described the cost of following him, recognizing that all other concerns take second place to following him. The Christian life will cost us everything to follow Jesus. Therefore, we need to sit down and decide whether we can pay the price. The second illustration is fairly similar, and it concerns a king going to war. A king must calculate the cost before going into battle. To avoid an embarrassing and deadly outcome, one must count the cost. It is foolish to not consider what it will take to be a disciple. But there is an interesting depth that is found in the illustration. The king must consider what the cost will be for not allying himself with the more powerful king. Verse 32 makes this point. 
if the king recognizes he will not be successful, then he will wisely send a delegation for peace. Faced with the threat of a superior army, the weaker party should consider his resources carefully before deciding to defend himself. We must consider the cost of non-discipleship. The first question we must ask is whether we can afford to follow Jesus. The next question we must ask is whether we can afford not to follow Jesus. Therefore, we must recognize, carefully consider what Jesus is asking us to do, what it will cost us if we do not follow him. First, the cost is stated in verse 33. If we do not renounce all that we have, we cannot be his disciple. We are called to give up all that we have. At the beginning of this teaching, Jesus said that we will have to give up family and we'll have to give up ourselves. We'll have to give up our very lives. We must give up everything to be a follower of Jesus. There is nothing that we get to keep for ourselves. There is nothing that is not required to be placed on the altar before the Lord. Jesus is not asking us to make room in our lives for him. He is telling us to get rid of everything to follow him. We cannot think that what God is asking of us is small. We do a great disservice to the world if we indicate that entering the kingdom of God is easy and following Jesus is simple. We are deceiving people if we suggest that a person does not have to do much to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says we must give up everything. We see churches today proclaiming all you have to do is just ask Jesus into your heart and say this little prayer and that's it. Once saved, always saved. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Get in a good Bible-based church and keep God first place. Jesus says we must give up everything. We can hold nothing back. There is nothing we get to keep in our hands. Now, earlier we tried to make the point that anything we are holding back, anything that we're giving our attention to or trying to keep is an idol. We were declaring that this person or object or activity is more important than Jesus. We are treasuring something or loving someone more than Jesus. We must renounce all things, all pursuits, all comforts, all desires, all causes, all crusades, and all efforts, and subject them to Jesus. Being a disciple requires the abandonment of all projects, plans, and personal goals. Otherwise, we are not his disciple. It is not a question of how little one can give, but how much does God deserve? He deserves everything we are, everything we have, and everything we cherish and prize. Secondly, we must consider the cost of not following Jesus. Just look at verse 34 and 35. If salt is no longer salt, what good is it for? Salt that has lost its saltiness has no value. It cannot be used for anything. Carefully read the words, it is thrown away. That salt is cast out. The cost of not following Jesus is enormous. You will be cast out. You'll be cast out of God's presence. You'll be cast out of his kingdom. You'll be cast into the lake of fire. You'll be cast into eternal torment. You'll be cast into the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Grace comes with demands. Jesus expects nothing that he has not already accepted for himself. If you are a disciple, do not quit. Everyone quits today. Everything that matters is hard and costly. Do not quit. Things get tough, and too often we quit because it is hard. Younger generations truly reflect this. You are going to face pressures to not intensely follow Jesus. One of the purposes of our time together is to help each other to not quit, but count the cost of not following Jesus. You will lose everything anyway. You will lose everything that matters to you. Follow Jesus and you will gain eternity and heaven and everything that truly matters in this life and in the one to come. Well, that concludes Luke 14. Next time, Luke chapter 15. Thank you so much. Have a great and wonderful day.